Okay, so we'll start. Um, this is this class is on the Kuntras called Beaker Chicago in English, uh, translated recently by Sichus in English in a book called Touching a City's Soul. And it it discusses and it it has translations of the talks and Maimaran of the previous Rebbe that were associated with his visit to Chicago in 1942. So <clears throat> we did the introduction and like an overview of his, of his visit. And we're gonna start what's called Sicha Aleph, the first talk. Um, it starts on page two of the book. People have the book in front of them. And it was a Sicha delivered on the 21st of Teves which um, was actually still in New York when the delegation had come to, had come to him, Arab Shabbos, and asked him to come and visit Chicago um, on Shabbos, which was the 21st of Teves. On Shabbos, um, the, the Rebbe gave this following talk for several hours and he agreed to travel and he traveled you know, um, a couple of weeks later. So it says Sikha number one and it's on page two. So again, this is two, this is a Sikha that the previous Rebbe delivered in New York in connection to his going to Chicago. So it says the customs of Lubavitch are based not only on Hatlacha, which means Jewish law, or on embellishing the performance of a mitzvah, which that sounds kind of funny in English, the word embellishing, but in Hebrew the term is hid or mitzvah, which means the beautification of a mitzvah. I think I would have maybe chosen something like the beautification of a mitzvah, um, which means just to do a mitzvah in the most beautiful way possible. So if somebody's going to, you know, get a mezuzah for their door, they're going to make sure that the parchment and the writing is beautiful and um, esrog, get a beautiful esrog or something like that. So the customs of Lubavitch, right, every, there's different, there's different groups of customs that different you know, this kinds of Hasidim do, or that kinds of Hasidim do, or Ashkenazim, or Sephardim, or there's different kinds of um, groupings of minhagim, of customs. So the customs of Lubavitch are based not only on law at, or on beautification of a mitzvah, but also on spiritual considerations that are vital to the soul. So like, um, I think it would be nice for everybody who's in this class to have a highlighter or a pencil or something that they can you know, underline or make little stars next to the things that are really central and they want to, as they're reviewing, they can go back and see that line. So I think that's like a really important line. Spiritual considerations that are vital to the soul, meaning the concept of a minhag, the concept of a custom, um, we're told by our Rebbe that it sometimes in some manner, the custom can be even more important than the law or more central to a person's spiritual growth because it helps them to develop a sensitivity to Hashem and a sensitivity to Kedusha. So here, the previous Rebbe is saying straight out that the customs in Chabad are very much connected to the spiritual considerations that are vital to the soul. You know, something that's an, like an extra measure of, of sensitivity. They place the di entire direction of a Jew's life on the basis of Avaida in such a way that he and his family are lit up by the spirit of purity that these customs bring. So again, this idea that what does a minha do? What does a custom do? They, they enable a person to have their life focused on avayda. The word avayda means, um, it, it means work, literally translates as work and it means spiritual work. That's the way that the term is used. That, that a person's life should be directed towards their spiritual work in such a way that he and his family are lit up by the spirit, spirit of purity, meaning that they have a sense, again, a sensitivity to holiness and that their life is gonna be surrounded on trying to sort of accomplish um, that connection to Hashem. The term Aveda, which is used as the term to mean spiritual work, um, it comes from the word, the, the shayrash, the, the root, shares a shayrash with the word ibud oirais, which we've discussed in other contexts and in, in other maimarim. Um, 
Ibud Aris, which is the idea of tanning the hide of an animal to make it into like parchment or something that's usable for like a cloth for a mezuzah or for a safer tyra. There's a process of tanning which softens the skin, it removes the hair and softens the skin and makes it more refined, basically. So the concept of avaida is seen to be the concept of refinement. Of a, There's a physical refinement of the animal skin, and then there's the spiritual refinement of the animal soul, basically. So the idea is that to refine our, our natures, that's the concept of avaida. So the Friedrich Rebbe is saying here that this idea that the, min, the minhagim help focus the person in such a way that they are concentrating on their avayda, on their spiritual refinement, and their connection to Hashem. Um, some of the customs of Lubavitch are intended for everyone, and some were practiced only by the Rebbe's the Nisim. So we have that idea, right? There's certain customs that the Rebbe would say, this is for, this is for everyone. Sometimes say these, this is, a, this is sort of, so to speak, a Chabad custom, and sometimes it would be a custom that's, that the Rebbein would encourage us to encourage every Jew to do. Like the importance of certain customs were for every Jew, so every person could benefit from it, whether or not they were a chassid. And some, and some customs were only for the Rebbein themselves, like that, that level of, um, I guess, refinement or avayda only applied to a Rebbe. So now, now he's gonna talk about a couple of different customs. This first one, is really basically just for men and then talk about other customs as well. And he's giving these as examples of customs that are important and, and all gonna sort of be a background to the main point that he's trying to make, which is gonna to get to. So it says the universal practice by which every individual reads each verse of the congregation's upcoming weekly tarp reading twice, and then reads the verse once in Aramaic translation is known as in Yiddish as Madras Nangzi Sedra. So this is a custom that's not a Chabad custom, it's a custom across the board um, that every week well, there's a Torah portion that's read in Shul called the Parsha or the Sedra of the week. Additionally, <clears throat> there's a translation printed pretty much in pretty much every Chomesh um, called Unculus, Targum Unculus. Unculus translated the Torah, one of the original translations of the Torah into Aramaic. Um, he was actually a convert. He was actually the nephew of the Roman emperor. There's a very famous story about him, about how he, um, how he basically converted at a time when Rome was at, was not in peaceful relations with, with the Jews. And his uncle was extremely upset um, at his, you know, defection, I guess you could say, in his, in his opinion. Um, and there's a whole con there's conversations, a whole conversations and stories recorded about how how Uncle had sort of um, almost trick his uncle into letting him leave where he went to basically learn Tyre and, and convert. And when his uncle found out, he sent soldiers to bring him back to Rome. And you know, Uncle influenced them, and they also stayed and converted and the whole up and back and up and back until until his uncle finally like blessed him with his path. Um, so he 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 was he was a student of Tyra and he translated the Tyra into Aramaic. Now, this translation is considered to be a basic foundational translation, and not just a translation, but it's also an explanation. Every translation is really an explanation because you can't, they, especially when you're talking about Hebrew. Um, but I'm sure anybody who's a writer would agree that once you've translated something into another language. It's, it's not exactly the same meaning anymore. It's as close as possible as you can get to it, to whatever the original meaning was, but it's not exactly the same because um, it, the words in different languages express things a little differently or they're built a little differently or whatever it is. So when, um, when a person learns Onkelis, or sometimes when a person doesn't know what the word is in Hebrew, they look into Onkelis to see what the translation is, and it's also an explanation. So um, there's a custom for, for that men follow every week to actually say the words of the Pasuk in Hebrew twice, and the word and the Pasuk in, in, of Onkelis once. It's called to my resign the Sedra, means to review the Sedra basically. And it's called, or it's called Shnayim 
mikra echa targum, which means the, the basically it means the pasuk twice and the targum once. And they're actually little booklets that print that print this, the words of the sedra with no commentary or anything. It's like a little booklet, pamphlets almost, like a set that you could pull out that week's parsha, and it, it has the puzzle repeated twice and then unclose once. Puzzle repeated twice and unclose once, so they could just read it that way instead of having to use a chomish and going up and back. Anyway, that's a custom. It's been a custom for I don't know how long, but many many years, and it's not just a chabad custom. So that's what the that's what the I was speaking about here. Um, anybody who like that's a custom that everyone everyone knows that this is done in fulfillment of the directive of the sages that one should always complete his partials his Torah passages with the congregation the idea that person should complete review the Torah portion that's how that's applied although there are ver there, there are various opinions as to the time limit for this reading the proper time limit is Shabbos morning before davening meaning you should have finished the review of the par of the parsha in this way before davening Shabbos morning in addition, one is obligated to hear the weekly sedra being read from a Sefer Torah. So binding is this obligation that even a congregant who's called to recite a bracha over the public reading and reads it together with the reader must do so very quietly because two voices cannot be heard simultaneously. So again, there was a custom at one point in time that a person would be called up to the Torah and they make the bracha on the Torah and they themselves would read that, that they would lane that, that section, that part of the Torah. As people became a little bit less learned, it became it, it could have become embarrassing for people because some people would know how to do it, some people wouldn't know how to do it. So they instituted that there would be one person who laid the whole tyra and just and the person would just be called up for the bracha versus called up for the bracha and also actually doing the the, the laning, the reading of the Torah portion itself. But what the Rebbe is saying here is that if a person who's called up to the Torah, they read along with the person who's laning if they if they can, but they should do it quietly because everybody's obligated to hear the words, the, the sound of the voice coming from the laner. And if the person who's called up is reading together with him loud enough, then the voices, you, you won't, it, it's not considered like you heard the laning of the Torah because two voices cannot be heard. It has to be one voice that everybody hears. This is not the, these are not the main points that the previous rabbi was saying. These are like background to like the idea of minhagim and how they affect a person. Um, I just want to finish this idea that the Rebbe of Chabad would begin the weekly reading by reviewing one or two aliyos on Thursday night. Now, so now the Rebbe goes back to talk about how, um, how did they do this custom of reviewing the, the Pasuk twice and the Targum once. They would begin by reviewing one or two aliyos on Thursday night the first two sections, right? And aliyah means that every sedge is divided into seven like sections, seven aliyahs. And a person is called up for a bracha and then that section is read. And then the person's called up for a different person is called up for a different bracha. And then that section is read. That's called an aliyah. Aliyah, the literal, the literal term aliyah means an elevation because it's seen to be that when the person gets called up for the Torah, that's like an elevation for their soul. There's, it's like a, it's a, it's like a beautiful thing for their soul. So the way, but now going back to just this idea that the, the Rabbim would review the first two aliyahs on Thursday night. On Friday afternoon, they would start reviewing the, the weekly Torah portion again from the beginning, reading the entire Sedra and the Haftarah. And on Shabbos morning before Davin, they, they would review the passage from the seventh portion onward again. This is, the, that's the way that they did it. Um, so that's, that that's like that's just a concept that the basically what the previous rabbi was saying in this section is that it's important customs are important and the customs of chabad are, are directed towards helping the person focus their life on avayda um and then gave some examples of of customs um they're they're gonna also give other examples of customs and other that are for everybody um, and then after a page and a half of this, like I said, the three was going to say, this is all background to the information of what I'm really trying to say in the sicha. Like he's he's building up, he's building up a point. He's giving a lot of, he's educating background information so that he can get to his point and we'll understand it when we get to it, basically. But it looks like someone had a question. No. Okay. So let so let's go on. So the top of page three. Following a tradition handed down over the generations, Chabad Hasidim observed the practice ordained by the Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, to study each day's portion of the upcoming weekly Torah reading together with the commentary of Rashi. 
Um, it's colloquially known as chitas now because it, it's we've all it's all, not just the chomish now. It's also telamantani, which I could talk about in a minute. But this custom is for everybody. Meaning, this is not just for men, and it's not, it doesn't even need to just be for levavshar chasid. And this is the custom that is what's called shavu lechal nefesh. Everybody could benefit from it. So um, the Alter Rebbe said, not don't just read the psukim twice and once targum unkelis but read every Pasuk of the Torah portion on the day of the week that is that connects to that Torah portion, meaning there's seven sections of every, every Torah portion, right? It's called Shani, Shlishi, Rudi, if you ever follow along in the Chumash when they're reading in the Torah, there's like you call a person for an Aliyah, they read one sec, the, and the Chazan or the Balkar reads one section, then the next person gets called up for a Bracha, they read another section, it's seven sections in every single Parsha, um, and there's seven days of the week <laughs> in every single week. <laughs> and so the custom is to learn that the first section on Sunday, the second section on Monday, the third section on, on Tuesday, and so on, until on Shabbos, you finish reading the whole uh, Parsha. Um, and this custom instituted by the Alter Rebbe is to read it and learn the commentary of Rashi. Rashi is... Um, lived during the times of the Crusades, like 1100s of the Common Era. So, um, he, was a, he was a sage, lived in um, France, and he, um, and he wrote a commentary on the Chomish, which is the basic, basic commentary that's studied by everyone all over the world. It's the first commentary that children start to learn. Uh, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe has many, many explanations on Rashi. He calls Rashi actually Yena shel Tyra, the wine of Tyra. That if you like, if you squeeze grapes, that you get the secret. The secret of the grape is the wine that the grape holds within it. Um, so it's like if you squeeze Tyra a little bit, then you know the secrets of Tyra come out. It's like Rashi is compared to the wine of Tyra. That Rashi has the same way that Tyra has a simple explanation and deeper explanations and 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 levels of explanation. So Rashi does also that. You can read Rashi simply, and he's a simple explanation of the Torah. That's what he calls himself, like I'm the simple explanation of Torah. But then if you squeeze Rashi a little bit, you see layers and layers and layers and layers of deeper meanings in the Rashi and his explanation of a Pasuk. So the, the Alter Rebbe asked his Chasedim to learn that week's Torah portion according to the days of the week with the commentator of Rashi. Um, if anybody wants to start doing that, it's very easy to do today, much easier than it was at one time, because you can go to Chabad.org and you can go to their learning tab and you can go in their learning tab, you can go to text and writings, or you can go to that day's chitas, and they have the Chomish, the Psukim of the Chomish translated, you know, Hebrew and English, and you can click either hide the commentary of Rashi or show the commentary of Rashi. And if you press show the commentary of Rashi, it will have the Hebrew and English of every verse and the Hebrew and English of every Rashi. And you can, and you can learn it through um, from the screen, basically, that it comes up and it even comes up. I think you can, set, you can click it in such a way that it just comes up that day's portion. So you don't even have to search for like which Parsha it is and which, which, which Aliyah it is and so on. If people are interested, maybe at the end of class, I can share a screen just so that you could see what it looks like, um, you know, how to access it. But it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful minhag, first of all, that the, the Arabian has us to do it. And over the years, other pieces have been added to it. So it's, if you hear people say chitas, this is what they're referring to. Chitas is an acronym for chomish, which is what we just discussed. And then there's also Tehillim and Tanya, another two parts of this daily learning that the Tanya, which is the, which is the written Torah of Hasidus, it's called the written Torah of Hasidus, is like the basics of Chabad Hasidic teaching, also from the Alter Rebbe, is divided up into days of the year that we, um, and, and we learn a little bit of Tanya every single day of the year, finishing on Yutes Kislev, which is the day of redemption of Alter Rebbe. And so there's a Torah portion every day to read with Rashi. And then of course we do the cycle of the year. So we finish that Simchas Torah time and the section of Tanya to read, which you can also get on Chabad also in English, also with commentary. Um, and then the Tehillim 
is the Book of Tehillim, the Book of Psalms, which are divided into 30 sections, are divided in a, different, a bunch of different ways, but one of the ways is 30 days, because there's either 29 or 30 days of the Hebrew month, so there's 30 days, and one day of the month, you say one that section, so like day one, day two, every till, not just Chabad Tehillim, are, are divided like that, but you can see day one, day two, um, and so you say that section of Tehillim for that day of the month, and then you finish the whole Tehillim every month. So it's um, it's like the revealed aspects of Tyra, Chomish and Rashi. It's the esoteric aspects of Tyra, the Tanya, and it's and it's davening, but that it says that you know the, the verses of Tehillim break through all boundaries. So it's Tehillim, and that the first letters of each of those books spell out the word Chitas. Chitas itself that is also a word by itself, not just an acronym. And that word itself means awe or fear. Um, and it's used in the Chomish of, a couple of times to describe how the awe of heaven um, was on the household of Yaakov as they traveled and, and nobody touched Yaakov's family. Nobody bothered them because the, the, the fear of God was on, the, uh, was on the people as they traveled. So the Rebbe explains that this, saying of chitas is a protection for the person and for the whole world um, and encourages everybody to have it. There's also physical chitas, like books that were printed by Chabad that have a Chomish Chal Mantani in it all in one. Um, it, that's only in Hebrew, but to have in the car so that the, the car is protected. Uh, we gave out last year at the luncheon the, the microfiche films of chitas to everybody who came that they could, you know, it's like a thin little like car, like a credit card, a little bit bigger than a credit card um, with microfiche of the whole Chomish Talmantani on it. Anyway, that's a very, I just took a time off our commercial break to talk about this custom because if people aren't doing it, it's always a good idea to start some, whatever part of it a person feels they can. It could be a little, you know, it doesn't have to be everything at once, obviously, but a little part of it. And again, Chabad.org has, you can go to Chabad.org and get the daily learning and just you know start a little bit at a time and then and then that's like that's a custom that helps a person di direct direct their life on a path of avayda that's as the previous Rebbe said so here he's just talking about the chumash part and the importance of doing that and then adds that a the chabad rabbeim did even more the rebbe's of chabad did likewise they learned the weekly Torah portion with rashi every day of the week, according to the Aliyah, and also added, adding also an additional commentary varying from year to year, whether the Ibn Ezra or the Ramban or the Arachayim. Um, one year, one of the Arabs chose the commentary entitled Panam Yafais. In other words, not only did they learn the whole parsha with the Rashi commentary, they also each year would pick a different other one of the commentators and also did the whole parsha with, according to that commentary. So that obviously is pretty, takes a much more time. Um, and, but then that would be a different commentary every year of the, of the parsha. That was not re requested of every single person, just the Chumash and Rashi. So I could feel off the hook a little, huh? <laughs> um, okay, next. Our Rebbe stated, our Rebbe state that the above described practice of reading each verse twice in the Holy Tongue and once in Aramaic is a halacha. Studying the commentary of Rashi involves one's Yer Shemayim, one awe of heaven. In the words of the Shulchan Aruch, he who stands in awe of heaven should read the Aramaic Targum and also Rashi. This means that studying the commentary of Rashi is a spiritual aid to the awe of heaven. So there's certain, the word spiritual aid is translated from the original, and he says in the footnote as a sagula, that there's certain things that we, that we do, certain practices that we do that create a conduit for certain blessings to come into the world and into ourselves. And the Rebbe has said that learning Rashi is a spiritual aid for, for a conduit for your Shemaim, for fear of heaven. It helps a person develop their fear of heaven. So it's a good thing to do. <laughs> The intent of the Rebbe, of the Rebbe is who, who every year studied a commentary in addition to Targum and Rashi was to become connected to the holy souls of the author of that commentary. So this is a very um, sort of esoteric mystical idea that when a person, he's actually going to develop it later on, 
um, a little bit more later on in this sicha that um, that when a person learns the commentary, a, a commentary, a, a, a holy person who wrote a commentary on the on the on the Chumash or whatever they wrote, it connects us to the soul of the person who did that, who taught that teaching. And in fact, when we sit, when we quote the words of that person, it like invites their soul into the room. So um, it's a, it's like, a, you know, we're not, we're like, we're very comfortable moving between worlds, you know, in Chabad, in, in Jewish mystical thought and Hasidus, it's like, there's no, there's not, there's just like a practical separation between worlds, but there's no actual separation between worlds. So like we want to be connected to the souls in the spiritual realms and it, hel it helps our spiritual growth and it, and it helps to, we'll, you know, we, we can understand better. We can, there's, there's all different things. And there's been actual times when, um, when it's actually, when it's like seemed like, you know, even physically, they could be present in a, in a spiritual garb that could be only visible to certain tzaddikim. Like, there's a famous story about when the Alter Rebbe, when the, when the first Lubavitch Rebbe was in prison, in um, and then released eventually on Yitzhak Kislev, was imprisoned in in Tsarist Russia for what they felt was, you know, against the crown activities or whatever. Um, it says when he was in prison, he was in solitary confinement, but he was visited by the Baal Shem Tov and the Magad of Mizrich, his teacher and his teacher's teacher, um, who had both passed away. But he, he talks about their visit, um, that they were like physically in the room with him, talking to him and giving him direction. So it's not like it's just sort of commonplace that we understand that there are, you know, the souls are, there's a, con there's a continuum between this world and spiritual worlds and, the, and, and certain people have the ability to visit up and back, you know, as they, as they choose, I guess you could say. Um, so when a per but when, when anybody learns the teachings of any tzaddik, it's like they're connecting to that neshama. This connection, what's the benefit of it? Like, why do we care? This connection opens up a conduit for the understanding and knowledge of the Torah. For the starting point of all original Torah insights, whether in the learned debates of the Talmud or the halachic rulings of the four parts of Shulchan Aruch, is an awareness of the holiness that is inherent in the very letters of the written Torah. I would like highlight that too, if I had a highlighter, you know, like meaning the whole point of learning Torah is like the, and, and the foundation for understanding new insights in Torah when we're learning is an awareness of the holiness that's inherent in the very letters of the written Torah. That it's not just an intellectual study. It's not primarily an intellectual study. That's not even the goal at any level. The, it's, it's a holiness that's inherent in the letters. It's God is sharing himself with us in the Torah. And so when we learn Torah, we are connecting to Hashem. And so when we learn Torah through the explanations and help of, of our holy teachers who were able to actualize that connection in a more revealed way and more easily accessible, that helps us to be able to do that also. We also are able to do that better through the teachings of holy people. It's like a, you know, it's like if you want to Mahabdil, you know, if a person wants to learn how to play tennis, they could they could read how to play it and 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 you know this step this step this step. But if like you really want to get good, then you hire a tennis coach and somebody who's like really proficient at at playing tennis and they give you lessons and then they say you know turn this way and this way and whatever and your swing over here is good but over here needs a little work or whatever they tell you and then you become more proficient in it. So if our spiritual life is just as important to us as playing tennis would be for somebody who wants to get trained in tennis, then we also need to like hire a coach. You know, we need, a, we need, to, we need to take seriously how, like how are we gonna learn about this? So somebody who's proficient at this can help guide us. So who are the people proficient? All of these holy rabbi and the commentaries, all of these people had very actualized connections you know they were the pros they were the tennis pros and so they can help train us how to become more proficient in our in our in our spiritual skill set
as well. This awareness opens up a conduit for the knowledge and understanding of the Torah and ensures that one's, Torah, one's original Torah insights will be true. Meaning, ha, ha, it, um, studying the Torah according to the commentaries um, and uh, being aware that the holiness is there in the Torah, that becomes the conduit for understanding Torah properly. You know, we're understanding Torah on God's terms from his perspective versus from our human terms of intellectual, just, just to making an intellectual study. I feel like we need to pause for a minute and see if there's any um, comments or questions because, you know, the previous Rebbe is deceptively simple in this particular, in his sikh, it's not in his maimar necessarily, but you know, it's, he talks, he's talking as if it's a father to his children, like here, I want to explain something to you, you know, um, and it feels like it's pretty simple things, but there's so many, there's so much depth and layers here about like his advice about what, you know, what to do and how to do. Um, so I don't know if people have questions or comments. It, it, if not, it's fine. We could just go on, but I don't know if there are any questions or comments. Yeah, I have a question. Um, hi, it's Bina. Um, my question is, did, so it says here that the rabbis would read. Okay, it sounds like when um, the last paragraph of page two, yeah, um, it seems like the rabbis didn't do this each verse twice with the Aramaic, is that correct? No, no, they did it. That's what he's saying. There's a universal practice which a person should do this. Besides, in addition, this is, I mean, this is when they or how they would do it. Okay, because the way it's the way it's worded, it seems like they didn't do the entire Torah portion twice, but they did somehow. <laughs> Yeah, I think each time they did it, it they said the psukim twice. That's my understanding of how it's done. It's not done two separate times necessarily. Oh, okay. okay, got it. Um, Chaya, this, I'm sorry. Chaya, this is Nancy. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions. What is Targum? What is it again? That's the Unclus translation that the the Roman convert. Oh, <coughs> okay. Uh, and... Targum, li Targum literally means translation, but he was a, he um, when it just says the Targum, the translator, it always refers to Unclus. Um, there's another person who translated into Aramaic whose name was another name, and he whenever it would, Targum Yonatan, he would always be called Targum Yonatan. Whenever you see the term Targum in this context, it just refers to Unclus. He's like you know, the translator with a capital T. So it doesn't say his name, but that's who it is. Okay, and then um, this Sika, what does that mean again? Let's talk. The talk, okay. The talk, and then could you just briefly go, really quickly going over the, um, um, over the, um, oh, uh, um, I can't even, I'll ask you later. Okay. Kind of lost it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. It'll come back. Um, yeah. I have a question too. Um, let me see. They read the, uh, the Torah is read in synagogue, like Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos. Yeah, the whole, the whole, the, is the whole uh, on Shabbos, the whole parsha is read on Shabbos. Right. What's Monday, Thursday, and the seven days of the, the seven day reading, it's uh, the, the portion separated into seven. And every, this is what you do like at home each day. Right. The seven. And then when you're in the synagogue on Monday and Thursday, what are they doing? They're doing some like, laying. They it used to be, used to be that, um, those were market days and they would learn, they're not supposed to go three days without learning Torah. So they would make sure to read the Torah 
three times a week so that everyone, if they, you know, living isolated and maybe weren't so learned so that people could make sure to at least learn the Torah every, every three days. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the actual best practice is to come to her in the morning and the evening, which is what uh, that's like, that's the possible, but it, you know, not to go out three days without reading the Torah. So they would, they, so it's not three, it's never three days. So Monday and Thursdays were market days. So people would come together because of that. Even people who lived in small areas or whatever, they would come together. I mean, I think that's how it's, and yeah. And they would read two, two of the, three of the seven or, you know, of, in those two, th two days, they'd separate the seven parts into, do you know what I'm um, you know what what I'm like asking? sections they read? Yeah, d it, yeah. Like the first three is read on Monday. <laughs> you know, I'm not even. I'm not. Like, I'm what not, do they do? I'm sure, I don't. I don't remember which sections. I I can find out. That's pretty simple to find out. But I don't recall at this moment. <laughs> Sorry. They don't. They don't read the whole sec. It's usually the it's first sections. sections divided into three. They read um they a few psukim for kaying. A few psukim for leaving, a few psukim for stroll. So it's the first, I don't know, 10 psukim of the Parsha, basically. But is it the same 10 Mondays and Thursdays? Yes. Okay. That's they go. also yeah. read by Mincha on Shabbos. So that's the true also. Coming week. That's also true. And that's what's read Mondays and Thursdays. What they, what they read um, Shabbos, Shabbos afternoon, afternoon is what they read Mondays and Thursdays. Oh. But what we're talking about Sanchitas is the whole Chumash, different sections of the week. It's not the same as the Torah reading on Mondays and Thursdays. That's the whole, that's the whole Sedra. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. All right, any other questions? Okay, so should we go on? So we're at the bottom of page three. So a couple of learned young men were once excitedly re reveling in their ability to impress each other with their ingenious original interpretations of the Gemara that they were studying together. At one stage, one of them was bursting with pride. He was certain he had discovered an underlying scholarly principle that was common both to a certain statement of Rava and Tractate Erevan and also another statement by Rav in a seemingly unrelated debate in Tractic Subas. So like the footnote says, it gives you like the term for that, which the term for that is um, Lashitasai, which means according to his like way that he approaches something. So this is a type of people tr want to try to find the similarity between the teacher's um, approach in, in, in one, idea and then another idea and like see like how he approaches life in general. The Rebbe does this many times. So here's a story, it's a bit of an ouchy story, but here's a story about this young, this young um, person who was learning and he thought that he found like the way, the common approach that, um, that Rebbe had. Rebbe's a, of a, a, a great um, Rebbe in the, in the, in the Talmud. So seated at the same table were for a few learned young Hasidim. Although the, ab although the above displays of brilliance left them unimpressed, they listened and they held their peace. After some time, however, when the above hypothesis was being touted long and hard, one of the young Hasidim could no longer contain himself. He addressed the speaker. Okay, so if you're afflicting the Tanam and Amaraim, that means the, that those are the, those are the the rabbis of the time of the Mishnah and the time of the, of the Gemara in one particular passage by imposing on them your innovative hypothesis, that can somehow be stomached. But what have you get, got against Rava that makes you drag him in iron chains from the tract at Erevin to the tract at Ksubos? There's a little bit of a, um, sorry, like reprimand or like a sort of like an ouchy kind of a thing, right? What is he saying? He's saying that, you know, Again, when you talk about somebody, when you talk in their learning, you're inviting them into that space, you're connecting to their souls. So 
He's saying you're like misquoting, misunderstanding Rava. So it's like you're dragging him in iron chains from one place to the next. Like, why are you doing that to the poor Rava? Like, why are you doing that? It's not so respectful. Like, this is not what he meant here. So like, you have to stop it because it's not comfortable for him. Um, so like what, you know, how real it was to the people that, how real it was to the people that they were interacting with these, these great scholars at a spiritual level while they were learning their, while they were learning their Torah. You know, it's like such a beautiful, such a beautiful thing. Um, my rapping man's a little sharp, but that's not uncommon between men, I think. Um, as we have said, true, true original Torah insights begin from an awareness of the holiness that is inherent in the very letters of the written Torah, right? That's, that's our basis. This is the conduit through which the Torah is revealed. Opening that conduit is usually attained by cleaving and being bound to the soul of the tzaddik. And such his kashos becomes possible only if one studies the original Torah insights of that tzaddik. So this is like a stepping, like step A leads to B leads to C, right? If the goal is to be able to understand Torah, we need to, and not only that, have original ideas, meaning understand something in a, in a way that you can explain it, that your neshama is bringing new light into an understanding of something. That can only be done from the foundation of the awareness of the holiness of Torah. And the way to really experience the understanding of the holiness of Torah is by being connected to the Atadik. Um, again, that's like the that I that the Havdil is you can perhaps compare it to this idea of having a connection to somebody who's an expert in something. And here what we're trying to be connected to an expert in, in Avaidas Hashem, an expert in connecting to Hashem, an expert in understanding how Taira is holy. Right? It's not just an intellectual study, it's it's God's word. God is sharing himself with us in the Torah. Um, and how do we get connected to the soul of the tzaddik? By learning his teachings. So learning a tzaddik's teachings helps us to become connected to that tzaddik. And becoming connected to the tzaddik helps us understand and realize and recognize on a deep level that Tyra is true and holy and God's word and um, not just a, not an intellectual thing. And then through that, we can understand Tyra better and maybe even bringing new understanding or a new way of applying some teaching that's going to be truthful. In a well-known exchange, a certain chassid once told a certain rebbe that he wanted to have a spiritual bond with him, to be a makusher of his. A makusher means connected. So that the rebbe uh, so that the Rebbe answered that if the Chassid would study the discourses of Chassidus, which the, his Rebbe delivered, he would become a Makusha of his because his kashras takes place only via studying Taira. So, you know, we have there, the, there's a, the term, his kashras is a term that's used by Chassidim to, dis, to denote their connection to, to their Rebbe. And this has been a very famously quoted quote, and it's many different times this idea has come out and it became also Tzim Hayom Yom now, uh, which, is a, which is the compilation of teachings from the previous Rebbe that I have put together, one for each day, that the idea of real hiskashus, of really how do you connect to the tzaddik is by learning his teachings. Um, and, you know, and seeing him is not enough. And there's, there's many stories, many, many stories. And in fact, you know, people after, after Gimel Tamas, after the passing of the Rebbe, the, many people started talking about like, well, how can people have a connection to the Rebbe? Who, who, um, the younger generation who grew up not seeing him or, you know, people who became connected to Chabad after Gimel Tamas or even before Gimel Tamas, but never went to see the Rebbe, like how can that connection happen? And it's the same answer as it's been for all these years, which is through the teachings of the Rebbe, that's how a person becomes connected to the Rebbe. Um, many Hasidim never saw the Rebbe. Like, you know, in Russia, people couldn't travel or there are Hasidim in Russia and the Rebbe's in America or vice, you know, vice versa. The Hasidim in different countries, travel wasn't so easy. There wasn't such a thing as internet and, you know, videos to watch and things like that. So, it's not even those seeing and 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 right now, right? Like we we see with the pandemic, right? People are not physically seeing each other, but still somehow, hopefully, feeling connected and 
and and close with each other. It's it's not the same, uh, but there. But with learning somebody's Torah teachings, it's even more of a connection than seeing them, because it helps a person to connect to their soul. Like we just said, we're connected to a person's soul and we learn what they've taught. Um, and we start to understand the way that they approach the world. We start to be able to think in the same manner. And, you know, there's the, the book that we did in our book club last year, Positivity Bias, where Kamasa put together, like the way that the Rebbe would approach certain things in life with a positive outlook. It, those are all very practical things that we can do too. And by learning the Rebbe's teachings, we sort of hope to develop those qualities in ourselves. And by developing those qualities, we become closer to the Rebbe because he's teaching us this. It's like, you know, a person's mentor, they become very close to their mentor. Um, so that idea of the importance of learning. And ultimately, when we learn Hashem's Torah, right, not just the teacher's explanations of Torah, but when we learn Hashem's Torah, that's how we become close to Hashem. We become connected um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another layer, in another, in another level. So this, all, all of this, the previous letter says now, now all of the above was an introduction to what I'm going to tell you about. This is all just an introduction to the points that he wanted to make basically here. So we could understand them because he had to give us all this background information basically. Okay, we're ready to go on. Any questions? Okay. So from the year 5648, whenever my father was at home, his father was the was the Rebbe Rashab, um, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. He showed me warm Hasidic closeness. His frail health often made him travel to various health spas. He had to travel that he was not very strong physically. As time went on, nurtured by the elder Chosid Reb Hendel, who was one of my mentors, I began to gain a better understanding of what Chassidusha guidance means. Now, in the morning of Shabbos Parshas Lechacha in the year 5651, 1890, before davening, I entered my father's study. He was seated at his table in a very happy frame of mind as he reviewed the weekly Torah reading with Targum. Again, that's Unculus, right? The Aramaic Targum, the, the nephew of of the of the Roman um, leader, his tears flowed freely. Remember, it's precious lachah. This is going to become significant later on in the story. So I was overawed. How, at the same time, could he be in tears yet in high spirits? It was a young boy, so he wasn't sure how those two could come together. Nevertheless, I didn't dare ask. <clears throat> That Shabbos, like every Shabbos, he davens until late. In other words, the Rebbe Rashab davens late, until late, for a long time. As on every Shabbos during the winter, he made Kiddush after davening, then went off to daven Mincha, and a little while before sunset, he washed his hands for the Su'uda of Shabbos. You know, Shabbos afternoon is in the winter in Russia is very short. It's pretty short in Chicago too, and it's short in Russia as well. So, because he wants to make sure he daven Shabbos, he made Kiddush, and then Damun and then he ate the meal. And that took until very close to the end of Shabbos because it was such a short day. In those days, as in that winter of 5651, the routine was that on Mote Shabbos, Saturday night, my father would examine me and what I had studied in the course of the week and also the Mishnahs that I had undertaken to memorize. Um, if my father was pleased with the results, he would give me a gift. He would recount an incident or a story and point out and explain what practical lesson could be derived from it. Um, the Rebbe Rashab also asked the previous Rebbe to record all the stories that he heard from his grandmother and from the elder Hasidim. And that's how we have le like a wealth of knowledge of the stories of that time of Hasidim and teachings and things like that is in the memoirs of the, of the previous Rebbe. Um, so here, the, the, the Rebbe Shab would and the previous Rebbe considered to be a gift. Uh, one of these Hasidic stories with like the lesson of it is a gift. Sometimes he would present me instead with a mimer. That's a Hasidic discourse. So his gifts would be spiritual gifts with practical implications. This was the case on that Shabbos Parshas Lachacha when my father examined me and gave me the mimer that begins Tanur Abanam Ner Hanukkah, which I had delivered in the year 5643, 1882. 
I really wanted to know why that morning while reviewing the weekly Torah reading, my father was crying, though at the time he was in such a happy frame of mind. I stood now perplexed, unable to decide whether to ask or not. Observing this, my father asked, why was I standing this way and told me that if I had something to say, I should say it. So I decided to ask and asked. My father answered, those were tears of joy. Once in his earliest years as Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe said publicly, one should live with the times. There were tears of joy, I'm just telling you, because it was Parshas Lech Lecha, we're gonna see in this teaching. The Alter Rebbe said publicly, one should live with the times, which at first glance for a Hasidic Rebbe to say one should live with the times seems to be a bit perplexing, right? Like that's not what you would imagine a Hasidic Rebbe would say to his Hasidim. When the younger Hasidim asked the elder Hasidim what this statement meant, those elders discussed it amongst themselves. Only several years later did the Mitzler Rebbe, that's the Alter Rebbe's son, explain it extensively in his characteristically Bina-like style, meaning um, the Alter Rebbe would say things in, brief, in a brief way, at least for part of his Nesias, and his son, the, who became the Mitzler Rebbe, when he became Rebbe, he was, he was called Harchava San Nahar. He was he like expanded on his father's teachings and he taught, he taught Hasidus in a very expansive way with lots of details and analysis. So he took that statement, which is one should live with the times, which is a Hasidic um, directive. And he explained what that means, but that was the next generation. However, when Lataba first made his statements, even the foremost Hasidim struggled in an effort to work out its meaning. Cause it's just, again, it's hard to understand. They finally heard it, meaning the meaning, what it was, the real meaning, via the altar of his brother, the holy Maharil. One should live with the times means that one should live with the weekly parsha, more specifically with each day's portion. Like we had just talked, like we just talked about with saying of Chitas, right? That on Sunday you say the first section, on Monday the second, and with Rashi. And not only you should say it, but like that's, you know, people wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and read the daily newspaper. They probably don't read the daily newspaper, and they go online and look at whatever they want to look at the daily news, like that's the daily news for a chasa. The daily news is that day's chomesh. Like you wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, read that day's chomesh, that's your news. Those are the, that's what's going on in the world. That section of chomesh is what's going on in the world. That's what it means to live with the times, the portion of the week. In those days, the chasidim and all those who had a spiritual bond with the Rebbe, old and young alike, used to study each day's chomesh with a commentary of Rashi. What the Alter Rebbe had said was that in addition, one should live with each day's particular reading. In other words, don't just read it like it's happened 3,000 years ago, live with it. It is, it's, it's, um, it's the current events or whatever you wanna say. Thus, my father continued, the reading for the first week of Bracious is a cheerful passage. It relates that God created the world and the creatures and was happy as it is written repeatedly and God saw that it was good. That's the beginning of the first Torah portion, right? Though the end of that week's sedra is not so pleasant. This, the sedra as a whole is cheerful. Besides, it is read on Shabbos Barashas when every congregation in the world is overjoyed. We started reading the Torah fresh. So like, it's pretty much a happy, happy sedra. Parashas Nayak is all about the mabel, the deluge, de deluge, and the che a cheerless week, which, however, ends on a happy note. Avram Avinu was born. So most of Parashas Nayak is kind of upsetting with the whole flood, but the very end of the parasha, Avram's born, so that's happy. The really joyful week is the, is the week of Parashas Lachacha, which is the week that this story happened in. For throughout the entire week, we live with Avram Avinu. Every, every aliyah, every section of the, of the, of the Chumash of that week has something to do with Avraham's life, um, who was the first to devote his entire life to proclaiming God's existence in the world. And this Mr. Snefesh for Torah Mitzvah, he bequeathed as an everlasting inheritance to all Jews, meaning us, us included, that Avraham it devoted his entire life to Hashem with self-sacrifice, and we inherited that ability from Avraham. So Parshas Lachach is a very happy week, because we live with Avraham every day of the week and we remember what we got from him. We see how he served Hashem. And it's like, a, it's a very exciting, happy week because this is how we became a nation from this person who was our forefather. So when he saw that his father was in a happy frame of mind because it was Parashas Lachacha. So he's gonna be in a happy frame of mind because he's living with the times. And the times are that right now we're living with Avraham Avinu and that makes it a happy Torah portion. So he's gonna be in a happy frame of mind. We should live with the times. So that so the Friedrich is saying it's not just a story that 
that's told that the Alter Rebbe said to his Hasidim, and it's not just a story that my father told me, but like we all, this is not just a custom for the Rebbe. Remember we said there's different customs. He started by just saying different customs. This is the custom he's talking about now. Say, learning that day's Chumash and Rashi and living with it, not just intellectually learning it, but living with it. This is the custom he's talking about now. This is a custom that for everybody in all generations, it applies. It's not just one of those special ones that applies only in certain times or to certain groups or something. So we should live with the times. For many tens of thousands of Hasidim, that brief teaching of Valdreva has charted a path in their Avedah in their service of the Creator. Reb Hill Parich, who was a Hasid um, at that time, introduced the concept that at the time we learned three things, meaning if from this teaching of Valdreva, we, we learned three things into the Hasidic world. This quotation, at the time we learned three things, it's like a quote from the Gemara, describes how from one brief specific halakhic statement from, by Rabbi Gamaliel, the sages derived three wide-ranging legal principles. In our context, this means that every pithy teaching should be understood in depth and many practical conclusions should, should proceed from it. He's taking a, a general, like a phrase in the Gemara that applies like from a short teaching, you can learn a lot of things and he's applying it to this. This was a short teaching of Alter Rebbe, you should live with the times. And we're, we have to expand it and apply it in deeper ways. To live with the times thus means not only one should study the daily passage of Chumash, but also that one should actually live in harmony with what, with what one has derived from it. I mean, we try to do this in the Parsha class every week, right? We try to like learn the Parsha and figure out what, it, what it's supposed to tell us for our service of Hashem. Being alive is the highest capacity of a person's existence. True, the superiority of man, the speaker, over the other creatures is his intellect, which is the highest of his faculties. So where um, there's four levels of creation, um, silent kingdom, like the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom. And the human kingdom is called medaber or speaker. Um, that's, that's how the human kingdom is related or, or called because we have the ability of speech and intellect. Um, so it's true that that is our defining characteristic. Nevertheless, intellectual activity does not continue throughout the man's 24 hours without interruption. In contrast, he continues being alive in equal measure, regardless of whether he's awake or asleep or when his intellectual activity is dormant because he's distracted by his work. And when a person lives with the times, in other words, he uses his aliveness to connect to Tyra, with the current Tyra passage, his life takes on a completely different quality. It is truly a Torah life, a life for the sake of which God created the world and gave the Torah so that one will be able to deal with his mundane matters in a just and righteous manner. In a word, a Torah life. That's what it means, you know, we should live with the times, meaning in our life, we should be living with the with the Torah portion of the week, and that aliveness makes us that we're not just alive. We're we're living a Torah life, and the Torah is what's directing and giving us that life and that enthusiasm. And how would you do it? Very practically, that week's Torah portion, and each day that day's section of the Torah portion. That's what we're going to be connecting to. That's going to be giving us. Um, like depth and meaning and, and a feeling of aliveness in our in our day-to-day -day activities. Um, so that is the that's the first sikha. So we see from we see from the sikha that, that, that the previous Rebbe is trying to like encourage us to understand and it gives all that background information, right? About customs, about about the, fat, the, the holiness in Tyra, about the need to connect to tzaddikim in, in order to experience the holiness of Tyra. And then what does this tzaddik say? He says, connect to every day's Tyra portion and figure out how it can inform our walk in this world, this day, this week, and so on. So I encourage everybody to go to Chabad.org. And do you want me to try to pull that up now? If people want me to try to pull that up and I can, you could see what it looks like. Would that be helpful to anybody or if people would just do it on them? Uh, yes, it would be. Okay. So I'm going to, I mean, I want to say class is okay. over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Class is over. But if anybody wants to stay on and, and see that, I will, I'll pull up the, I'll pull up that. Thank you, Kaya.
Thank you. So